Well, hey everybody, we're back. We're uh, we're just now getting ready to put the sanding sealer on our big town sign project. Both of them. We spent the last few days sanding using the detail sander, block sanders, hand sanding, getting in and around all the little font uh, for the 2.5 dimensional uh, engraved side. The back side is only uh, is only a two dimensional engraving, which that. Trust me, that goes very easy. Well, the main reason that we seal uh, our, our projects uh, is this right here. This is a softwood, and there are three main reasons that you want to seal a softwood, or at least why I seal it up here. One, pine and cedar, although the, the attributes that they have, like knots, when done right, uh, they are very charismatic, they're very charming to the piece. However, cedar and pine, both of them can leak sap. You don't want that sap bubbling up through your finish or turning this dingy yellow. It's not very appealing to the piece. That's one reason we seal. The second one is this, and this is probably one of the more important reasons as to why I seal. There's an emblem right here. I know you probably can't see it, but there's that 13-inch emblem with the covered bridge, the mountain scene. All right. This is going to get airbrushed, and what generally has happened to me with softwoods in the past, pine, poplar, and cedar, is when I go to airbrush, especially the black, if you could look at wood, especially this, this pine right now under a microscope, and you could look at it where the engraving tool paths are, you would look at it through a microscope and you'd see all these little tubes. Well, those tubes are basically like straws. And what has happened to me in the past with softwoods is when I go to airbrush, even if it's at a light PSI, there's still enough pressure in the airbrush to push some of the paint into these pores. And I've literally seen before my eyes a streak of paint, you know, and it's kind of like smearing, you know, the, the kitchen window on the inside and looking at it from the outside. You can't clean it from the outside, and it's not as though you can go underneath the layer of wood. You keep sanding and sanding until eventually you put a divot to try to get that that little bleed through or that run out. That's probably the biggest reason why I, I seal my products is because I don't want the paint to run in the engravings throughout the piece and, and, and look awful. And then third uh, and, and last is I can put one coat of uh, one coat of sealer on here. Excuse me. And it may end up saving me, depending upon the material, multiple coats of a clear finish, whether it's lacquer, uh, you know, varnish, urethane, whatever the case is, the sanding sealer will help to block the pores so that the wood isn't going to sit there like a sponge and start sucking up things that are, you know, big, big money per gallon, okay? So, bleeding, leaky, sappy knots. Stop the runs from our airbrush uh, and airbrush paints from running through the material, as well as to minimize the amount of clear coat or whatever surface coat you choose to use, okay? So we're going to get this one uh, sealed up. We're going to use an HVLP gun, uh, high, uh, high volume, low pressure, excuse me. This thing works. Uh, and it's, it's no big deal. This is a Husky from one of the big home improvement centers. So, but it is a handy tool to have in your arsenal. I'll tell you what, especially on bigger projects. I'll be able to seal this in a couple minutes versus however long it would take me with a brush, okay? So, in between doing this, you know, we're trying kind of multitasking today because we do have other things going on. But, uh, you know, please stay tuned. we got more to come. We told you we're going to include uh, some picture stills in with all of this. So... Ladies and gentlemen, hang on. We have more for you. All righty, guys. All right, hey, everyone. Well, as part of our finishing end of our Big Town sign tutorial and our basically the, the, the project itself, we did have a, I had a subscriber write in and send me a question so I, I figured I'd I'd kind of do a little finishing uh, part to this to this town sign project so what I what I used on the back of my uh, my two-dimensional 
in Graveside, the thank you for visiting Northumberland. We just used the very simple, well, hopefully I've got it on the screen. It's just the number two. It's got a very long bristle on it. And you saw in the photos, or you'll see in the photos, uh, there were pictures of me doing all the cutting in. Now I've got to do the 2.5 dimensional edges, which coincidentally, this is what, as we explained to you in the fabrication end, <clears throat> When you get your font in place and you've decided where everything's going to go, whenever you highlight an exterior border, had I have not highlighted in the program this exterior border, this would have been a two-dimensional engraving. But because we wanted to raise letters, we highlight the border, the interior border, and I know you can't see it down below, but there's the 13-inch diameter ring. So, and we went down to 300 thousandths. Well, what happened, <coughs> excuse me, is afterwards we follow up with a 60 degree V bit. Now this is where the painting becomes time consuming because as the 60 degree V bit, after all the hog out is done, that V bit goes around to clean up all your letters or numbers or, or both, whatever you happen to have in your sign. And it almost leaves an end grain. Well, not almost, it does. It leaves an end grain. And if you've ever painted or stained that, you've, you've seen how much, uh, you have seen as to how much paint or stain that can suck up. What I basically do is I load up my brush and I go around interiors and exteriors. I go around once, I do the exterior, and then I go back and I do the interior again, and then I do the exterior. Any area that's like a cross-cut board, it, it, the V-bit just makes one heck of an end grain. So it really sucks the paint up. But, on the good news side, <clears throat> the one thing I like about this one-shot sign painter's paint is it, it does level itself out pretty nice. I use these uh, disposable, they have a 45 degree angle uh, or a bevel on each side. I take the, uh, I take the lid we take the lid to the paint can and we load it up. You can load up both sides. I don't want to load it up so much that it's dripping and running by any means. But what I'll do is I'll come up here and let's say we use uh, what's what's in the screen that looks pretty good. We can use the O. I'll go in and I'll dab this on. Now this is we're on the flat. This goes relatively quickly. And these things are less than a buck a piece, so it doesn't break my heart if I don't get, get around to cleaning them at the end of the day, which is about where we're at. I'll just take and I will continually go around and pat. Now what we're leaving behind, however, is air bubbles. But because this is a softwood, I like to kind of, if I can, almost drive the paint into the pores. Now, to get rid of all this very lightly, I just do a very slight back drag, or a little, little drag with the with the little foam pad brush. Now I know that the grain direction is horizontal so I'm going to go in the direction of the grain the best I can and like I said what's nice about this is is it will not leave any type of brush strokes or these little foam pad strokes whatsoever. This will almost self level and that's pretty much it. I do my facias one coat with the, uh, with the foam brush we do our interiors with a really long number two, because you got to remember, we got to get down inside there, 300,000. You'll see that in the close-up photos, the little still images. But this works out pretty well. But like I said, it's time-consuming. Okay, so. But I did want to, uh, and I and I I apologize again. I can't think of the name of the gentleman who uh, who sent in the questionnaire. But we try to get to everybody. That much we do. Well, it's Friday, everybody. We're in uh, for a long Memorial Day weekend. I hope uh, by the time this gets published, I hope everybody had a really, uh, really good time with, with friends and family and whatnot, and uh, everyone was safe, okay? Everyone take care. We've got more to come. We've got the scene to airbrush. Now, by no means am I any, uh, any kind of uh, Corey St. Clair, but we'll, uh, we'll do our best to uh, get some color in there and show you how we, uh, we'd airbrush that out, all right? That'll be in the next part, uh, next part to come, all right?
Hey everybody, well we're back. I thought we would continue on. We are getting ready to shoot the scene down in the bottom corner of our uh, of our big welcome to uh, welcome to my town here in Groveton, Northumberland. I thought we'd go over real quick the stuff that we use, the stuff that we pull. I like to have all this stuff ready and laid out so that at a second's notice I can grab whatever I need. All right, our airbrushes. I run two of them up here. Uh, this is quicker than trying to paint these by hand, but basically I don't run high-end airbrush equipment up here. This is, a, this is a master. I buy all my airbrush supplies too from either TCP Global or Coast Airbrush Supply or CoastAirbrush.com. Uh, this is a master. It's a model G48. It's got a two millimeter tip in it, and basically what it's meant for is doing very, very fine detail. Now granted, this is not a high-end $500 Awada that can do a, a hairline. No, 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 no. It can do a pretty small line, but it's, it's like a $40 gun. It's just a Chinese or an Asian knockoff of the higher-end guns. Not bad for detail. This is my Pache. This is an American-made. I wish I had bought this one first because you can buy... This has a 5mm needle and tip in it, but you can also buy the 2mm tip, so this can become a very versatile gun. If I were to recommend one, I would say the Pache. This is made in America, it's made in the U.S., I think right out of Wisconsin. All right. Now, the paint that we're using is Wicked Colors by Cretex. Uh, tough as nails. It's used in everything from automotive, professional airbrush guys, you know, gas tanks. And if they're going to trust this stuff on, on Harleys and 50,000 plus dollar motorcycles, by God, I've, I've had great luck with it on my wood, uh, my wooden signs here for the last three years, so that's what we run. It is water-based, though, and everybody right now is going, Steve, I said you were going to stay with oil. For how strong this stuff is, like I said, it's never let me down, and this is a very basic, this is going to be a very basic engraving, uh, and we'll get into that uh, here in just a second. We're only running four colors, by the way. We're running black and white as our, uh, our two base neutral colors. I'm running green and blue. Blue for the water, green for the, for the spruce trees, and a little bit of grass, and some uh, the mountains. I'll probably do a little, bit, a little bit of gray in them because Percy Peaks, I've climbed both of them, and one of them is pretty much all rock. So we're going to try to keep the, uh, keep the scene as appropriate as possible. Now, between, doesn't matter what airbrush you're using, uh, but in between color changes, you've got to clean your airbrush. Okay, that's a given. You don't want two different colors mixing, and oh boy, the next thing you know, you got a big problem. Well, in between as I go, I give a little shot of water. It's just a, I think it's a chemistry bottle of some form. Uh, you can buy these through any of the uh, online retailers, and I believe any of the airbrush places carry them. This one's got water in it. I have run a water-based paint. Uh, so for the most part, I can, do, I can do some good cleaning with that, but you do still need an airbrush cleaner. So coincidentally, I make my own. Uh, and this is going to be probably my first tip that I give you guys. I watched another gentleman whose abilities are well above and beyond mine, but uh, I corresponded with him and I said, listen, you know, I've been buying the gallons of airbrush cleaner, but they're like over 30 bucks a gallon. He's like, no, 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 no. Uh, he basically told me, when I corresponded, he said, Steve, get yourself a, a gallon of distilled water. Not, not filtered, but distilled. You don't want any heavy metals or anything in it. Pour out um, 28 ounces. So that's roughly three and a half cups. Go down and get yourself uh, a big bottle of just cheap blue glass cleaner. Nothing scented. Uh... I got this at the buck store, I got this at the supermarket for 99 cents. This gives me enough to make two batches. And this one gallon, uh, when you put 28 ounces back in here and you give it a shake, there's your cleaner and it's less than, uh, it's less than a dollar and a half, okay? So if you want to go buy the big dollar cleaner, hey, I won't stop you, but I am always trying to look out for your, your pocket as well as mine. All right. In the event I've got some paint that's dried up in these, though, I will, again, buck store, I'll go down and I'll drop a little isopropyl in there. So if there's any, any paint that's dried, any of the uh, Cretex paint gets dried up on the walls of the cup, gets dried up inside, on the needle, I'll run a little alcohol through, but no matter what I do, whether I'm using my homemade cleaner or the isopropyl, 
I'll go back and I'll always send a little water through it afterwards. All right. So, Pache, TCP Global in-house brand master uh, model G48 airbrush. That's pretty much what we run. Uh, I keep an array of brushes handy because as you're going to be working this close to something, after you've stared at the letters that you've painted now for, for days on end, there may be a holiday in something. Well, I make sure I've got brushes and I've got my yellow paint handy just in case I need it. I keep my putty and my putty knife handy. Like I said, you stare at these things for days on end, you, you can miss something. So we have whatever we need ready when we need it. I have an incoming airline here. I got another, uh, we own two pancake compressors. One's under the machine, the other one, uh, the boss switch is over there. We hook it up to an airline with a pressure regulator and a water trap. Nothing, nothing major. We keep little brushes handy. Before I actually drop the paint into the engraving, I'll give it one more quick brushing to knock out any sawdust. <laughs> this I consider a luxury item, but before we get going, you know, the one thing we will do, oh, here it is. I'm going to take, and because we're going to be dealing with overspray, well, I don't want to have to go back and rework this sign. We don't want the overspray getting where we don't want it. Okay, the other thing that's nice is this easy mask. Uh, Robin's Auto Parts, your hardware store may have it. Uh, it's basically uh, pre-adhesive uh, tape put on paper. So I can, uh, I can utilize this wherever I want. I can put a piece there. I can say, oh goodness, I don't want uh, to get anything uh, oversprayed up here. I can put another piece in. I can basically block off and have better control over where my overspray is going to go. Now, if anything were to get on the border, it's not the end of the world because it's going to be kind of a dark forest green that goes over, but we do not want to get airbrush paint in the flats right now. That would create a bit of a problem. Uh, the other thing to have, I can't stress this one enough, if you're going to, at some point you're going to need to tape things off. Oh my goodness. This is a painter's tape. This is a... Uh, this is green, they got the other blue tape out there. What it does is it has very, very low adhesion. So if in the event I were to have to put a piece of this on any of this fresh yellow paint that I did just over the last few days, when I go to peel this off, you know, it's not going to take any of the paint with it. So that to me is also important. And that's basically it. What we're going to do is, because we're going to do the outline of the engraving first, all right, we're going to mix up some black paint. I generally mix it up right in the cup of the gun. I put my reducer in first. And for any of you who are going to ask, yes, it is water-based, but no, you cannot thin this with water. You will need to use uh, their 4011 reducer, 4011. Uh, it's specifically designed for the Cretex paint line. Pretty simple. I'll put in whatever I want to put in my cup. I'll add a drop or two of paint. This is a little stainless steel upholstery pin. I use it kind of like a paint mixer. I won't put anything in here that's wood. A little wood fiber could get caught in the gun, jam it up. I hate being in the middle of a job when I'm brushing, airbrushing, and all of a sudden my, my gun freezes up. I gotta break it apart or clean it. It's a pain in the butt. So we try to do everything we can to prevent that from happening. All right, that is about it. Like I said, we keep, I keep it simple, Steve. I'm not an authority on airbrushing. There's a ton of videos out there. I would definitely say uh, look at, uh, look at coastairbrush.com. A bunch of incredible, incredible artists in there, all right? But uh, we'll, give you, we'll give you a little bit of a uh, video as we, uh, as we get into this, okay? So please stay tuned. We'll have more to come. Oh, okay. Now watch my step. All right, everybody. Take care. We'll be right back. Oh, hey, everybody. Well, here we are. I told you we were going to get into a, a little bit of the scene and some of the airbrushing that we do up here again. Uh, I certainly, by no means, claim to be an authority on airbrushing. I consider myself uh, advanced beginner, maybe intermediate, but again. You're not going to see us doing high detail airbrushing on, on vehicles and gas tanks and motorcycles up here. It just I don't have that skill set, okay? Well, the first thing 
I do is I'll take, and I'm using, uh, and I had told you in, in the previous video, we use two airbrushes up here. My master, which is a, uh, it's, it's basically a Chinese knockoff of a, of a higher end fine detail brush. It does the job though. Okay? It's roughly a $40 gun, maybe 10 bucks for shipping, but it does what it needs to do. We go in, okay, and the first thing, I'm going to make sure we got glasses on, and the first thing we do is we get our black in to where we need it, okay? Nothing major. Wherever your bit is engraved, we cover that in black. Alright, well, the compressor is shut off, so once we've airbrushed this, and, and we use, like I said, we use our 2 millimeter fine detail, I try to hold into the, the, the lines that were cut uh, with our 60 degree feed bit as best I can so that there is minimal overspray outside of the tool path itself. We'll then go in and I'll grab, uh, I'll grab my orbital. 120, whatever you happen to have on hand, okay? Now what we do is I just sit here and I'll sand this. Now what may happen, because it does have some sealer on it and we do have a little bit of paint, what may happen is you may get some of the sealer and the paint built up on your pad. What will happen is as you're sanding the paint, it will heat up and the next thing you can do is smear. If it starts to smear and I got just a little bit of that effect, if you don't have a way to clean your pad, uh, break it off, put a fresh pad on, and start again. Now what we'll do is once this is sanded, uh, we, we can generally go a couple different ways. Some guys will paint uh, light colors to dark. Uh, in my case, I choose to work dark to light because I can always go back uh, like I said, we only use four paints in this, so I can go back with a white and I can kind of dull things a little bit if need be, but when we paint, I paint light and I'd rather add an extra layer in repetitive layers than I would to put on one or two real heavy ones and go, oh no. Because if paint is really heavy or you have a malfunction in your, your, your airbrush, hopefully you don't, and then suddenly you get a big wad of paint on there, well you really need to let it dry or wipe it off immediately, because uh, when you do go to sand it, it may heat up and smear really bad, and then in which case you're better off, in my opinion, to strip it, remill it, okay? Because sometimes uh, the paint's smearing, and each time you just go to sand it off, you just keep making a bigger mess. So as soon as I start to smear, I stop what I'm doing, I either let it dry for a little bit more, or in this case, I'll just change out my pad, okay? All right, everybody, hang on. We'll be right back. All right, everybody, we're back. So the first thing I'm going to start with is I'm going to try to get comfortable on this milk crate. And then I'm going to start with my green. Now, there's a lot of other greens up here. They're vibrant, dark green. So that's what we're going to focus on first are the trees. And... Then we'll move down to the uh, to the grassy area, and we'll just shoot that a little lighter. Now the trees, uh, we've done these before, and keeping them dark is, uh, in, in my opinion, is a uh, is a nice uh, is a nice look. Have yourself a little test area to throw some paint. I'm running my tank right now at about 30 PSI. I do have a, I have a valve, an air control valve on the side that I can regulate my air pressure if I choose, right here at the gun. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the trees. And I'm just going to go in, because they are the trees, I'm going to go in a little heavy with the paint. Okay, and I'm going to follow this right down. Now, what we have on each side of this little mini waterfall here, uh, it looks like uh, some type of dam material or some constructed, uh, I don't know if this is a, an earthbound dam or maybe it was built with just logs, but what I'm going to do 
Uh, and I said that there was four colors. I forgot one. I forgot the brown because back in the old, old, old days, dams weren't constructed out of concrete because we just didn't have that sort of stuff back then. Uh, what we ended up doing uh, hundreds of years ago were, you know, dams were constructed from rocks and, you know, trees and timber and things like that. So we're, we're going to try to keep it as, you know, somewhat original as we can. Now, again, we're going to just, we're going to lay the green right on the trees pretty heavy. From the tree line, we're going to fade into a gray because I told you Percy Peaks up here where I live is, you know, we live in the Granite State in New England. So the rock face on the particular mountain is, is stone for the most part. It's a, it's a granite colored light gray. The sky will be blue. We'll put some white puffy clouds in. And ultimately what we'll do is we'll try to put like a white cloudy rim around it. So it would look as though you're looking out a porthole. Uh, whenever we do our, our lines though, and we do do a transition from a darker to a lighter or from one color to another, we definitely want to pay attention because what happens if you mix blue and yellow together? You get green, okay? So when we're going to transition from one color to the next, I've gone in dark, like I said, with my trees. Now when I get down to the lawn here, I do have a couple trees in here, so... Wow, what do you know, the compressor stuff. Okay. I said my trees, they're dark. Okay. We got our trees in. Next thing I'm going to do... No, let's darken this one up just a bit more. I'm going to come in and I'm going to focus on the grass just a little bit. Now I'm going to go very lightly. Little by little you're going to see your color pick up as you're adding it. Now I'm going to keep my edges very light because either I'm going to blend it like I said with the rest of the sky or when I do go to uh, when I do go to do my layers I don't want any one thing too heavy in any one place. Some of your areas that are going to be really dark, like the bridge, not the bridge, excuse me, the dam is going to be brown, or it's going to be a brownish. Another thing to keep, uh, keep track of is, in this case, I did engrave this one a little bit light, the other one was engraved heavier. Well, I have, in fact, sanded out a couple of my lines. Now, fortunately, in your CAD software, if you want, you can print out the rendered image. You can print it out so you, you have a reference to go by. I would definitely and strongly suggest that. But have reference material, especially if you're going to be doing something that's more than one for a client. You want things to match as close as they can. Okay? All right, well, I'm going to finish brushing this up. And when we get it just about done, we'll bring you back in. We'll discuss a little bit more. But that's basically how I'm going to do it. I'm going to work light. I'm going to work in layers. I'm not going to try to rush this. I mean, we have come this far with the whole project. It'd be a crying shame to love something up now, okay? So take your time. Be patient. And yes, patience, patience is a virtue, by the way. So, <laughs> excuse me. We have finished our scene. Give it just a little bit of touch-up. There's a couple little spots that I'm fussy about, but that's me. For the most part, I have no doubt that my client would be, uh, would be happy with this. But there are just a few things that we're going to touch up. Uh, little, little black highlighted areas we will do with a brush by hand. And that is truly about it for the scene. As far as the airbrushing goes, as I told you before, I don't consider myself an authority. There is a pile of information uh, between YouTube and the, and the net. Go out on our, our wonderful World Wide Web if, if you want more instruction because, like I said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm advanced beginner, intermediate at best, and I am probably not the guy to tell you how to, how to airbrush, okay? But I will say, and I will stand by this, I, I believe, in my opinion, that airbrushing these scenes is a lot faster and it comes out a lot nicer than if you were to do something by hand with a brush, okay? Everybody stay tuned. We've got... Uh, We've got one last small piece to basically close all this up, and uh, that'll be it. That will fulfill this uh, our big town sign finishing video, okay? All right, everybody, you hang on. We'll be right back. Oh, hey, we're back. Let me get this iced coffee out of my face here. 
All right. Well, one, it's nice to be sitting here on a stool speaking with you, other than sitting on the floor like I have been for the last few days. Uh, well, this is pretty much it. This is the end of our finishing video. I just wanted to take a brief, quick second here. I know it's been a long video over about a half an hour. Uh, we just told you a second ago, the only thing we have left now, our scene is done. I need to remove my tape and I need to put two coats of yellow paint around the flat fascia of our, uh, our 13 inch diameter uh, seam circle. All right. I will most certainly give everything a quick once over. I'm going to double check, make sure underneath I haven't got any uh, missed spots. I'm going to make sure that everything is sanded, all cracks are filled, everything has been sanded. Basically, final inspection. Now you do notice that the rim is not painted just this minute. Like I said, the only thing we have left is this yellow rim and our green uh, trim around our sign. That goes exceptionally easy. I found this uh, at my local, uh, my local Ace Hardware, we found this, uh, this quaint little, it's a little disposable roller tray with a small roller and you can, uh, you can basically roll your edges and then all I'll do is I'll take a small, uh, good quality, probably an inch, inch and a half inch wide brush and then I'll back drag everything because I told you that most of the foam brushes, foam rollers, they'll leave air bubbles. We don't want to leave that in our client's sign. Once that's done, this thing goes outside just like you saw in some of the earlier photos uh, with, with us putting the sanding sealer on it. I will do the exact same thing with the uh, marine spar varnish. We'll, uh, we'll spray it on and then what I'll do is while it's in the flat or while it's on the stand uh, laying flat, if I've got anything that looks like it's pulled up or any heavy spots that I've sprayed, I'll go back in and I'll take a brush and I'll back drag everything. Bring it inside the shop, we let it cure uh, for at least half, three quarters of the day. Uh, and the other thing that I do up here, I know some guys, some guys do things differently, but for the most part, I never do more than two coats of anything per day. Airbrush paint is really about the only exception of the rule because it dries so quickly as it's atomized uh, through the airbrush on the material. But as far as this uh, one shot, Signers, uh, sign painters paint, I never go more than two coats a day if it requires more than two and I allow at least a minimum of three days once this thing has got the uh, marine spar varnish on it to actually hang up here in the shop, be left alone and just cure. It says right on the instructions for the can, it takes about three days for a good solid cure so we give it that, okay? Alright, well everybody uh, I'm finally glad that we made it to the end of this darn, this darn thing, this, this whole project. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love doing it, but these big ones can sometimes, they can wear on you. Uh, but it was, it was an awesome undertaking, it was one heck of a challenge. I can't wait to do another one next year, alright? But uh, any of you, as always, if you ever, ever have any questions, please hit us up, steve at littlewoodshop.com. You can also check us out on the funny pages, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, Pintreat. We're all across the board. Just drop us, a, uh, drop us an email, and I promise I'll get back to you as promptly as I can. And my followers, my subscribers, I know some of you have been waiting a while to probably see this. I'm sorry it took so long, but hey, when you're a one-man band, you do the best you can, okay? As always, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I appreciate your support so very, very much. And uh, enjoy the rest of your week. I hope that uh, I hope everybody had a great Father's Day yesterday. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll see you Wednesday for the midweek shout out. Okay. All right, everybody. Bye bye.